when it hits you, you kind of go, oh, geez, uh, I must have done something there that uh, <laughs> somebody likes. So, like baseball for me, it's been a passion, you know, ever since I was a kid. And uh, I just kind of continued on with it, continue on with it today. So I really like giving back to the game. Welcome to episode 251 of Alberta Dugout Stories, the podcast. I'm Joe McFarland. When you think baseball in central Alberta, one family name is synonymous with the game, Northcott. And while he may be too humble to admit it, Harold Northcott is an Alberta baseball legend. The Clive Alberta native had a storied playing career, which took him to Eastern Oregon University, where he helped the Mountaineers set team records for wins in each of his three seasons, while he accumulated a record of 18-9. and nine. And that's where he also earned the nickname the Giant Killer for becoming the first pitcher in school history to win two games against big Pac-10 teams. Northcott went on to represent Canada on the international stage a number of times, including being named the most valuable Canadian of the 1985 Intercontinental Cup. He started his coaching career in 1988, helping guide teams in St. Paul, Rocky Mountain House, and elsewhere to provincial titles. He also served as the Canadian National Youth Team pitching coach in the 1990s, later to become the Junior National Team, and those teams featured names like Jordan Zimmerman, Ryan Dempster, and Eric Gagne. Yeah, pretty good. Then he coached with the National Senior Team of the Pan Am Games, amongst others. If you're a regular listener to this podcast, you've heard his wife, Barb, who's heavily involved in the women's game in this province, and all three of their kids, Dustin, Chad, and Heidi, all blazed their own trails in baseball. Recently, a little birdie by the name of Brad Mills told us that his longtime friend was inducted into the EOU Athletics Hall of Fame last month, and as it turns out, the recognition was a long time coming, as was this great conversation we had with Harold Northcott last week. Harold, thanks so much for joining us here on the podcast. Thanks a lot, Joe. Appreciate uh, the invite. Let's start with the most recent news here. Eastern Oregon University recently unveiling its Hall of Fame class of 2023, and you were inducted a couple of weeks ago officially. First off, take us back to the beginning on this one and how you found out that you're going to be recognized. Well, this one's taken a little time, and uh, it all started back in 2019, and everything was kind of ready to go for 20. 2020 and uh, unfortunately we hit the COVID part of it and so the two those two years um, it was it was actually the Hall of Fame uh, all the inductions was it was cancelled so then they um, and then last year they didn't they didn't do it so this is the first year they've had since 2019 so it was a um, it was kind of a long process my coach Fetz Howard Fetz was my coach down there at Eastern Oregon and uh, he did a phenomenal job on putting this all together and just kind of keeping it, keeping it in the face. And and uh, the, I guess the bittersweet part of it, um, all the work that he did on this, and there was there was other people involved as well. But um, four days before the event, uh, Coach Fetz passed away, so he didn't actually get to see it. But I'm sure he was looking down on it, having a good giggle because I, I told a couple Howard Fetz stories. Fantastic stuff. We'll talk about Coach in a second. Take us back to 2019, 2020, when that first, the ball first started going. What's going through your mind? Because it's not like something where, whether in any line of work, you're not looking to get the accolades. You're not necessarily looking to get into a Hall of Fame. So what's going through your mind as you're being kind of recognized in this way? Well, it's it's kind of an odd one, right? Because you're absolutely right. The, uh, like you don't, you don't do these things um, to go to the Hall of Fame or, you know, have, have, uh, awards and diff- different things like that. Um, so when it hits you, you kind of go, oh, geez, I, I must have done something there that uh, <laughs> somebody likes. So like baseball for me, it's been a passion, you know, ever since I was a kid. And uh, I just kind of continued on with it, continue on with it today. So, uh, you know, I really like giving back to the game. Uh, and that's kind of where all this, all this took me, right? After I graduated university, um, then I, you know, moved back to Alberta and, and went into the municipal government part of it and was in the recreation side. So then I was able to work with lots of athletes all across the province and, and continue to do so to this day. Mm-hmm. Takes back to the days with the Mountaineers, 1984 to 1986. You had some pretty massive performances yourself, wins over a couple of big Pac-10 teams at the time. Any favorite memories or moments when you look back on your time at EOU? Well, I guess for myself, like I'm a I'm a real team person. So probably, you know, I had had some. Uh, you had mentioned them 
beat a couple Pac-10 schools. And as a NAI school, that's you know that doesn't happen very often unless you're an LC State. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was that was really special for me. Um, and it was I, I was the first pitcher to ever uh, beat Washington State. Um, so that one that one really felt good. And, and Howard Fetz, he just thought Bobo Brayton was the greatest baseball man ever, which he was. But Howard would wear uh, his helmet. The only time he'd wear a helmet coaching was when he played Bobo Brayton. And Bobo Brayton always wore his red helmet. So Howard would bring out his blue helmet. So mm-hmm. so that I think that memory for me was was really special. The year before I lost to him, like in the ninth inning, they squeezed in the winning run, which was kind of a hard way to lose the game. <laughs> but but I, I think that was one of my favorite memories. But just going back to the team concept part, like the three years I was there, the win record was 30. Uh, first year I was there where you hit 32. The next year was 34. And the last year was 38 wins. And for an NAI school, when we play a lot of Pac-10 schools, um, and when I say a lot, I mean, it was nine nine games in those last two years. But, it, it, you know, it's a pretty tough schedule that, that Coach Fett's got, you know, put in front of us. Mm-hmm. And we played 60 games every year. So we got the most out of it. So I think those were probably, you know, the things that I really liked. The, the teammates we had were phenomenal. You know, we had some guys play pro. Um, in this day and age, there probably would have been a few more. You know, just there's there really quality hitters, really quality pitchers on that team. So mm-hmm. you were known as Giant Killer for those big wins. Do you remember where that nickname took place? Who made it up? Uh, take give us the origin story of that moniker. Well, Coach Coach Fetz, he um, the after my junior year, that, that was two years or the year that I, I beat both those back ten schools um, in the press book the next next season. Uh, Howard Fetz dubbed me the giant, giant killer at that point. So then I was just known as the giant killer. So I went, I, I could live with that one. That was a good one. I actually, uh, my uh, university ring actually inside the ring has giant killer on it. Oh, very so cool. It's a, it's a good reminder. No kidding. We talk a lot about it now and through dugout stories, we've been able to share the stories a lot. But back in those days, it wasn't like Canadians were a, a, a hot commodity, I'll call it, in the U.S. college sphere. Here you are, small town Canadian, small town Albertan, tearing it up at on a big U.S. stage like that against some big teams. How different was that for you? Well, it, it was it was quite different. You know, I had some really good people in Alberta that uh, helped me along with that. You know, Ray Brown, or Franchuk, uh, Keith Vandeker, um, you know, John Osborne. He tried to get me down into Oklahoma state and I, I turned it down just because I didn't know what I was getting into doing this. Right. Mm-hmm. So are there some regrets there? Uh, maybe a little bit, but they kind of got me onto that scene where I, I went to uh, the junior national program uh, in 1980 and that opened up some doors for me uh, at that point. Now I didn't go to university for a couple more years after that, but you know, what the baseball, you know, did for me uh, down in the states, and 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 it, it's tough, right? It's back in those days, it was aluminum bat, mm-hmm. and it wasn't easy. I mean, it's aluminum bat now, but they're drop threes now. They weren't drop threes back then, right? <laughs> so it was it was a different different time frame altogether. Uh, you know, at my university, I was the first Canadian baseball player to go there. Um, there was, I know there was a guy from Lethbridge there that was a football player, but, uh, I was the first Canadian baseball player, but me going down there, what that did, that opened up the doors. There was, uh, probably nine or 10 players came after me in those next, you know, three, four years, which was really good because that kind of opens up some doors for other baseball players. Right. Mm-hmm. And they were all quality baseball players up here that went down there, you know, so it, it, it was a, it was a good thing. Um, but it was a it was a little intense. The first year I went to a junior college, and um, I found that I you know I really wasn't any different than anyone else. I I could uh, I could play with them. It wasn't a big deal. So I went on to a four year school, mm-hmm. and there it was you know kind of the same thing. I, my coach uh, he kind of helped me with a few things on the pitching side of it that kind of changed my kind of changed my appearance on the mound and. And I could I could throw overhand, you know, fastball, curveball, um, but he changed me to throw it from the side as well. 
So that gave me four pitches right there, mm -hmm. which made it pretty tough. They're all different speeds, they're all different different things. And so then that opened up the door uh, for the Canadian national team in 1985. And I went to the Canadian national team. I played there for three years, and that was just a phenomenal experience. What the, what did that do? Open up another door. I coached the Canadian national team for seven years. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not big into name dropping, but I got to coach Ryan Dempster and Eric Gagne for two years. Mm -hmm. Like that was that was really special. And then when I went to the senior team, you know, Justin Morneau, Jason Bay, you know, uh, Ryan Red, Redmanovich from Calgary, like all, all these guys that played professional baseball, just outstanding young men. And I think that was probably one of the biggest things I really took away from that. Like these people, they were grounded and they knew what they wanted and they went after it. And they were very respectful. Mm -hmm. Looking back on that post secondary, uh, you went Big Bend and then you went to EOU. Post secondary always teaches you life lessons, even beyond the ballpark. When you think back on that time, what was the big lesson for you? What was that big takeaway that you kind of bring with you every step along the way, whether it be with Canada or whether you be, you know, where where we're recording this one now at the dome? Well, I, I think the biggest takeaway for me and, and kind of what I pass on to young athletes today is um, the hard work part, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't you don't get anywhere in baseball unless you work hard. And that doesn't mean just working hard at practice. That means working hard on your own as well. Like you're like it's a it's a full time job. If you if you want to be a good baseball player, it's not like you're just gonna come come to the facility, you know, the practice field, practice for two hours, two or three times a week and play a couple games on the weekend. That's not what it's about at all. And you know, like the strength part of it, you look at what goes on today compared to back when I was in there. I remember the strength program for me, I, they handed me the, the sheet, uh, a one pager, this is what you're going to do for the winter for strength. And it was the football program. There just wasn't any information, right? Mm -hmm. like what you really need to do for the baseball side. Now, I'm sure there was at bigger schools, you know, if you went to a Wazoo or Oklahoma State or those types of schools, but you know, a smaller NEI school, it, it wasn't there. So, you know, the, the working hard and, and, you know, like never giving up. And and that's one thing I really see in athletes today, like that, you know, they want to quit and you just, you just can't quit. Mm -hmm. You just got to keep going after it. Like your dream is, is what you're going after and you're going to make that happen, you know, one way or the other. So just working hard and, and, and never giving up. Like those, that'll take you a long ways. I mean, the, the talent side is that's just a different thing altogether. If you've got the talent, that takes you a ways too. But I've seen lots of talented athletes that didn't go very far because they didn't have the work ethic or they didn't have that, you know, never give up. Mm -hmm. One of the things I always said as a manager was I'd rather have somebody with a hundred percent attitude and eighty percent talent than someone with a hundred percent talent and eighty percent attitude is sort of a, a, along the same lines by the sounds of it. So it's cool exactly. that we're in the in the same boat there. Fast forward a little bit now and and going back to this last couple of weeks here, you get to go back to EOU for this recognition and a Hall of Fame class. What was it like being back in your old school again? Because I don't know, has it been a while since you've been able to walk the halls and, and see some old faces? Well, I, I, we did go back in 19 um, because that was kind of the, the setup year for 2020. Right. Um, just to see, you know, kind of how things went. And it was great to go back and, and you know, see – see some of the old teammates. Um, but yeah, it was quite different. Like the, you know, even in the four years since 19, uh, you know, new buildings have gone up. Some are being renoed, you know, went into the library and just went, I don't even recognize this place anymore. Um, so, and, and, you know, even with the, uh, you know, the gymnasium, we were, you know, after class, we'd always go there and there was a couch and some chairs. We'd sit around and talk baseball. Uh, the, the facility's totally changed and, and, and for the better. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was, it was kind of like, is this where I went to university? <laughs> and, you know, it was fun because uh, my, my son and, and his wife, they came down as well. And um, like Jad says, wow, this is a nice place. Like the campus is gorgeous. And it was just like, you know, I just kind of took that for granted. That that's that's what it was. It was up in the Blue Mountains. It was kind of a way. We didn't play a lot of home games because, you know, we had snow snow there just like we have, have back here. So, mm. um, you know, 45 
45 of our games would be on the road. And if we had a home game and it was raining or snowing, Coach Fetz would be on the phone and he'd have another field and we'd be driving. So we've got always got our 60 games in, but it was it was really nice to go back. Uh, what they're doing now, they're trying to build a new baseball field, um, which they desperately need. And uh, so the alumni part of it, uh, hopefully they can they can help out with that side. Well, I'm sure you're going to have uh, you'll have the ear of a few people, uh, especially given the the recent accolades. You've mentioned him a few times. Share a couple of Coach Fett's stories with us. <laughs> Coach Fetz, he um, he was a, a Rhodes Scholar, very intelligent man. Um, he was an English professor as well. So when you're in his English class, uh, just because you're a baseball player, you you didn't get any extra credit <laughs> there. He, he was actually probably harder on you than than anyone else. So so he you know um, just very dedicated to, to coaching baseball, loved baseball. Um, one of the stories I'm going to share with you, he was. Uh, we were playing over in LC State, and uh, he he got mad. There was something went against us, and he kind of he didn't say a lot to the umpires, but he was mad this time. And, and so he spoke to him. He coached. Uh, we should go back a little bit. He coached the Dutch national team at one time. Okay. So he could speak Dutch. So he spoke to him in Dutch, <laughs> and what he said, I'm not sure, but it wasn't very nice. It didn't sound nice. And the umpire responded in Dutch back to him. Oh, no. <laughs> so, you know, he just kind of put a big smile on his face, turned around, went back to his coaching box. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was it. <clears throat> but he, he had this one saying, and he said this a lot, and I've never heard it since. But he, when, if things weren't going well for you, you know, if you, they weren't going well for you on the mound or you weren't hitting well, defense was it's kind of a struggle for you. He says, don't get your dauber down. I'll have to let you look up, get the dauber. And uh, yeah, it was, he always, he said that a lot. Uh, that's the one I really remember. Don't get your dauber down. Yeah, I'm going to have to do a little Google search before too long here. Uh, you, you mentioned the the connection with the coach, obviously you got a chance to catch up with some former teammates as well. What's that been like over the years, being able to keep those connections alive? Because you hear that from athletes <laughs> as soon as they leave college and, and in the years after is like, those are bonds you get to keep forever. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, uh, Brad Mills, he's instrumental in this, uh, for me being inducted into the Hall of Fame as well. Uh, he lives in Calgary now, from Montana, Montana originally. And, you know, it's great to see him again. I, I see him regularly, um, you know, now that he's up in Alberta. Um, but some of the other guys, there was one guy that I, I was really good friends with, Blake Jones. And I saw him four years ago, but, you know, we, we just – lost touch with each other. He's not big on, the, you know, keeping in touch on the, you know, by, by anything, phone, you know, Instagram, <laughs> LinkedIn, doesn't matter. He's just, just not that way. He's from Utah. And it was just like, we saw each other last week and we just started in again and, and told some stories about, you know, some of the things that, that happened at Eastern when we were playing there. And uh, he's coming up next summer. Him and his wife are coming up. For a visit, he said, uh, "You know, I, I don't have a passport anymore. I lost. I let my, you know, I let that go." And I said, "Well, you're going to have to get it again." And he says, "You know what? I am, and we're going to come up. So uh, next fall, him and his wife are coming up to to stay for." I said, "Come up for a month. <laughs> I'll show you around." So, yeah, it, it's really really nice. You know, other other people, you know, I stay in touch with them, you know, texting them or whatever it is. But you know, I, I need to do a better job, and you know, other than me, emails, I need to get some phone numbers and sit down and talk to some of these people because they were they were special people in in our lives and when i was down there barb and i were married right so mm -hmm. we, i was uh, one of the few guys that was married when i was in university but um it didn't seem to matter they they uh you know always talked to barb and did things together as groups whether it's you know, some of the guys had their girlfriends or whatever it was it was just it was always really special to be able to you know, just kind of have those discussions with, with the players, mm -hmm. kind of old memories. It never hurts as well when you get to grab a glove and a ball and maybe throw one around or heck, even playing an alumni game. We were off air chatting about this and I wanted to bring this one to the, the four. Uh, you did pretty good, didn't you? <laughs> you still got it. Yeah, n not too bad. You know, I, I was the oldest player on the field um, and I, I pitched the, the sixth inning 
and uh, struck out the first guy and then uh, popped the next guy up and a ground ball to shortstop and the inning was over and I went, geez, that was quick. Did you have to have any ice afterwards? No ice, no, no. <laughs> there was ice in the cooler, but that's about it. The best kind of ice, I got to say that. <laughs> Obviously, after your time at EOU, you had a, a really phenomenal playing career, including uh, a bunch of opportunities to to wear the Maple Leaf. I'm always curious, especially with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, hockey players get asked about the Maple Leaf on the front, but what's it mean to a baseball player to be able to wear the Maple Leaf on the cap in Canada across the chest like you've been able to do? You know what? Uh, I was very fortunate with that. I, I had... Uh... I did it for four years as a player and I did it for seven years as a coach. And I, I just like, you're just so proud when you've got that Canada across your chest. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it just makes you feel, feel so special. Um, just a, a quick story. We had in 99, we were in the Pan American games. And I was, I was coaching at that time. Ernie Witt was the head coach and uh, we like, we tore it up. Right. We had the best record in the tournament. We got a bronze medal. That's a, that's a different story, but it was really, really funny because we had a number like Aaron Guile and Todd Betts and Rydman, Redmanovich. Uh, like we had probably five or six guys, Jeremy Ware, that played AAA. Like they were, and some of them did play in the big leagues. Um, but one comment made, the other guy I did miss was Stubby Klopp, who's the uh, first base coach for the St. Louis Cardinals now. Mm-hmm. One of the guys, uh, he said, you know, this has been such a great experience. Why don't we just keep this team together and just play in the independent league? And it was like, wow. Because, you know, in the minor leagues, I mean, it's a grind. Mm -hmm. Anybody that's played in the minor leagues, it's not easy. And if you get out of there and you can make it to the big leagues, wow. But that was the comment. And, you know, most of the team went, yeah, let's do it. Be great. Some of the younger guys wouldn't, right? Because they still still had that dream of of, of moving on. But um, things like that uh, really, you know, you just really kind of gives those tingles down your spine, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in '99, again, in, in the Pan American Games, we had two guys. We had a guy named Steve Green. who was he was kind of stuck in Long A in California. Mm-hmm. We had uh, Cubs uh, right-hander Mike Myers. Um, he was stuck in Double A, I believe. And they both tore it up in the Pan American Games. The next year, they're both in the big leagues mm-hmm. because of what happened in the Pan American Games. They were able to handle the Cubans, you know, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans. Didn't matter. They absolutely destroyed them in the Pan American Games, and that's what it did for those two players. And and you really, you know, the next year you're watching TV and you're watching those guys pitch, and and now they're tearing up big league hitters. And you know, you just wonder how many guys get stuck down in there and just don't get that chance mm-hmm. and they get that opportunity at such a unique facility and a unique experience as well whether it's pan ams or nowadays you've got the world baseball classic as an, as an example and doors are starting to open one of those doors that i i always think of is the junior national team and i know it was the uh under 18 team that canada had when you were coaching there uh you mentioned some names earlier the ryan dempster zira Gagne's, the justin mornos when you look back on it over your years of coaching or even as a player for that matter do you remember that one athlete where you looked at them and went dude's gonna be a player dude's gonna go places who is that one guy that you'll always remember that big first impression well i, I think both those pitchers uh eric and ryan were were in that category ryan was only 16 when he made uh, team canada and it was it was a little it was a kind of an off year for team canada uh there wasn't wasn't a lot of big name players around and and he as a 16 year old he was our starting pitcher in the in the world championships um he was he was that good and you know if you look at you know kind of where he came from you know small town um he had to ride his bike down to the ferry to get across to play in the mainland and like he just he was he was that guy and, and eric gagne same type of thing i mean he it was just explosive the ball coming out of his hand um but I remember one time, John R., we were struggling at the plate in the 94 World Championships, and we were losing to Holland 3-1, and John R. says, Gagne, grab a bat. So Gagne grabs a bat. What's he do? First pitch, hits it over the fence. We lose 3-2. <laughs> oh, man. Not, not, that's, 
that's but he was just an athlete. Yeah, just an athlete, right? Like that's that's incredible. Thinking back on it as well, from a, a coaching perspective, you've had a lot of success on that front. What's been key to that in terms of whether it's getting the buy-in from the players? What what's been the key in your eyes to to building successful program time after time after time? Well, I think one of the things um, <clears throat> it gets a little tougher as I get older, but like I always put the effort in, right? Mm-hmm. Like I threw batting practice. I had fungos. I, I did all that stuff. I just didn't sit back and let my assistants do the work, right? Like, I was right in the middle of it. And I think, it, you know, I, you know, looking back, at it, I think the, probably the players looked at that and just, you know, went, boy, if he can put that effort in, we can sure do that. Um, you know, some of the – some of the play, when I, we lived in Rocky Mountain House, and uh, like there was a group of players there that, that we coached. You know, we won a Western Canadian Championship in the AA – um, it wasn't AAA, but we did go to AAA into the, you know, 18U division for a couple of years and did very well at it. Um, but, but those players stayed with it. And, you know, we had a number of players, um, uh, from those teams that, that played college baseball. I think there was 14 on that list. Um, two of them, you know, played professional baseball just for a short stint, but they, they got an opportunity, right? So mm-hmm. when you look back at that, it just... So I, I don't know. I think the, the players, that they respected that, that, you know, just kind of the hard work. Um, I, I got respect right off the top, like when we were first come out of university and moved up to St. Paul, just because, you know, I was a, um, come from college, had a baseball background and played on the national team. So the kids gravitated to that. There wasn't a lot of baseball up in that area at that point. And they went on and won these three or four provincial championships in the next three, four years. And, and they, you know they're still still going strong up there. So I think some of that, you know, you, you get you get some buy-in just because of what you've done. But you still have to be able to put that time and effort in. Doesn't matter what you've done in the past. I always tell my players, you know, if what you did yesterday still looks big to you, you haven't done much today. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of the players kind of look at that and go, okay, I guess my uh, three-run homer to win the game yesterday, I got to work a little harder. And that's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. I remember a quote from Steven Tyler of Aerosmith who said that you're only as good as your next hit. And that was the same kind of thing that I think baseball uh, lends to as well. Is it's great that you did that yesterday, but what are you going to do for me today? So love yeah, that. Exactly. The success on the field is obvious. The success off the field is something else too. And you've been able to marry the two to a certain extent as well with the family. And we've had the pleasure of having both, uh, as you mentioned, Barb on the show, but also Heidi's been on the show as well. Dustin and Chad have had their own uh, journeys in baseball as well. How cool has it been to have had the family aspect of things and making baseball become a family affair for you? You know what? It, it, I think of of all all the different accomplishments, and I think that's my proudest is, you know, both boys played Division I NCAA. Um, you know, they played Division I junior, uh, junior college. Um, but I always give the boys a hard time, right, because – Heidi played seven years on the Canadian women's national team. And if you look at my phone, my, my picture on the phone is Heidi pitching for team Canada. And I, I always make, keep the boys humble and, and just let them know that, you know what, one day you'll make my phone. So yeah, <laughs> have the kids, kids, uh, you know, <clears throat> if you, if you have somebody kind of excel in a sport as a parent, like you feel pretty good about that. But when you have three excel at it, um, yeah. and and I'm not not the only one on that side of it. Like mm-hmm. Barb was huge on that side because somebody had to keep us grounded. Somebody had to had to you know organize and line things up for us because we were going different directions all the time. Mm-hmm. And Barb was a was a huge part in making that that part of it successful. And and uh, you know the baseball side on the field, I did that part. But <clears throat> yeah. Three, three, uh, Dustin, Chad, and and Heidi, just super proud of what they've done and, and what they're doing now in their careers. So it's, it's really nice to see. How crazy was that day planner back in the height when all three of them are heading in separate directions and you and Barb are trying to figure out how you're going to get from point A to point B to point C all in one, you know, felled swoop at different times? Yeah, <clears throat> the... And it was a day a day timer back then. <laughs> it wasn't a phone. It would have been a lot easier if we had a phone. But um, I, I remember one time 
Jed was playing spring hockey. He was nine years old. And tournament in Calgary, uh, Barb picks him up in Calgary, drives him to Tabor for the third game of Provincials on the Sunday. He pulls into the diamond 20 minutes before the game, warms up, pitches a complete game. She comes back, meets me at the door at midnight back at Rocky Mountain House. And I opened the door and I said, Barb, this is crazy. <laughs> we, we can't be doing this. Like this is just too much. He's nine years old. So, but that's that's what went on. <clears throat> and it went on for many years. But you know, we we survived it and uh, the kids really enjoyed it. And Barb and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And and now uh with Dustin and Janelle, they're expecting their first. Um, now we get to watch it. Are you going to watch it or are you going to be part of it at some point down the oh. line too? Are you going to be teaching them oh, fastballs I, pretty early on, I assume? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I already bought a left-handed glove. Okay. <laughs> you got them all set up. That is fantastic. Uh, the final question for you, I am cognizant of the time. This question we ask everyone, and I'm sure you've heard it a time or two already. Wondering what your answer to this one's going to be. What does the game of baseball mean to you, Harold? Well, it, it provides for my family and myself, it provided so many different opportunities. And it wasn't just the baseball side of it. And when I talk about team sport at the start of the interview, um, being a team player and and passing you know that type of information on, um, you know whether it's to the kids or it's it's to young baseball players, um, I, I think that's probably that's probably you know the biggest thing is is just what you can learn from it. Are you going to play professional baseball? Probably not. But what what can you do? For me, I wanted to get the education, then I wanted to get the good job with it, and I succeeded in that on the municipal government side, and I got to continue to do the baseball side of it, and at a high level for 11 of those years. So for me, it was perfect. Uh, but but I think you know just doors that can open, and whether you know you're an athlete, whether you're a coach, you're an administrator, whatever it might be. There's something there that can help you in your in your life and just make make you a better person and to be able to contribute to society. We've certainly done that in spades, Harold. Congratulations again on the Hall of Fame induction and all the success you've had in your baseball journey. Continued success as you go forward, whether it be at the Dome or at home life as well as you get that little whippersnapper uh, in the game shape before too long. And again, really appreciate the time. Thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your story with us. Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks again to Harold Northcott for joining us this week. And again, congratulations to him on being named to the Eastern Oregon University Athletics Hall of Fame. As always, if you like this or any other episode, make sure to drop us a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. A tip of the cap as well to our platinum supporters, the Oak Tokes Dogs and AHP Academy for all they do for us and for baseball in Alberta. For more on our amazing teammates, head to albertadugoutstories.com slash supporters. Until next time, thank you for all of your support online, on social, and on air of Alberta Dugout Stories.